On the left I have a bucket that's attached by a rope to a pulley. As the weight of that bucket pulls down on the rope, the rope will pull on the pulley causing it to rotate. On the right hand side I have a similar bucket that's just going to be dropped from rest from the same height with the same mass, but it's just going to be in free fall. And I'd like to study the motion of the objects by figuring out how much time it takes to go from a height y to the ground. And so of course the bucket on the right is only affected by gravity, but the bucket on the left will be affected not only by gravity, but by this upwards tension and by the rotation of the pulley. I'd like to start by just drawing in all of the forces that act on these objects, both of the buckets and also the pulley itself. On the bucket on the right, the only force that acts on that one is the force on the bucket due to the earth, the gravitational force which points downwards and has a magnitude of mg, lowercase letter m. That same gravitational force acts on the bucket, lowercase letter m times g, and then there's also an upward tension force due to the rope. By consequence then there's that same tension force which pulls down at the contact point there between the pulley and the rope. And then lastly there's a couple other forces that we normally don't think about and that is the pulley itself has some weight and so there must be a downward gravitational force due to the weight of the pulley and then if those are the only two forces acting on the pulley then the pulley should be moving down too there must be something that's holding up the pulley because we think of it as being a fixed object and so running through the center of that pulley there's probably uh, a metal rod that connects it to a wall or a clamp or something like that and so the pulley itself is resting on, you know, that rod. There must be some upward force that is being exerted on that from the axle or that rod. And so we'll call that an upward normal force. There's something supporting it up. Similar to the way that if I put an object on a table, the table pushes up. If I have an object that is, you know, rigid, not moving due to an axle that's in its center, then it also exerts a normal force upward on that object. And so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to write Newton's second law equations for each of these objects. If the positive y direction is upwards, then the Newton's second law equation for the pulley looks something like n minus t minus mg equals zero. The acceleration is zero, so the net force should be equal to zero. And what this tells me is that the normal force should be equal to the tension plus the weight of that pulley. And while I'm not incredibly interested in the forces of the pulley because it's not moving up or down, it's important that you're able to see that fact. But what I am more interested in is what the buckets are doing. So the buckets both are going to be accelerating downward with some acceleration and we know it won't be the same acceleration because the net force on each bucket isn't the same. So for the bucket on the right the only force that acts on it is the gravitational force mg and the acceleration is downward so on the right hand side the equation is mass times that negative acceleration. And so of course we see the masses cancel and the acceleration is equal to minus g, right, exactly what we expect, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. On the left hand side uh, we get a slightly different acceleration, right, because we have this upward tension. Here the tension minus that gravitational force is equal to the mass times that negative acceleration, whatever it is. We know it's not g. So the crux of this problem is realizing that the bucket on the left has a smaller net force than the bucket on the right and because of that it has a smaller acceleration. On the left that tension force is canceling out some of its weight and so we get a smaller net force and a smaller acceleration. On the right we know we just have an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. At the beginning I said that I wanted to figure out what would be the difference in the amount of time that it would take for these buckets to fall from a height y down to the ground. And so you could analyze this in terms of the initial and final energy of the object, the accelerations of the object, or you could just use the kinematics to see how much time is it going to take for the object to fall to the ground.
The equation that I'd want to use here to describe the kinematics of this object is probably the change in y position is equal to the initial velocity in the y position times time plus one half the acceleration in the y direction times time squared. The reason why this is useful is because as I stated the initial velocities are zero so this term cancels and I can find that any change in height is equal to one half the acceleration times time squared. And so the amount of time it would take the object to fall some vertical distance y is this equation rearranged for t. So t is the square root of 2y divided by a, which we've seen before. Right? So for some height y, I know the amount of time that it's going to take for, for the object to hit the ground. All I need to do is substitute in the uh, expression for the accelerations. For the bucket on the right, I can already do that. The equation for the bucket on the right is just t equals the square root of 2y over g, because the acceleration is equal to g. And so now for the bucket on the left, I need to do the similar thing, but I need to substitute in the correct expression for the acceleration. The problem we run into with the equation on the left is I can't solve for that acceleration because not only do I not know the mass, but I don't know what the tension is. And so one way we can get around that is by writing an equation for the rotation of the pulley. Because if I look at the pulley, if the axis of rotation is the center point, the tension is what causes the rotation of the pulley. The tension causes a torque that causes the rotation of the pulley. And so if I can write a torque equals I alpha equation, Newton's second law for rotation, that includes a torque due to the tension, then I should be able to get an expression for the tension that I can plug into my force equation down below. To write that equation then, I'm going to write Newton's second law for the counterclockwise rotation of this pulley. The torque that causes that counterclockwise angular acceleration is the tension. The tension is the force. The distance from that force to the axis of rotation is the radius of the pulley. And the angle between R and T is 90 degrees. And so the torque from the tension is just equal to T times R. And I know that the tension is the only force that causes a torque because the normal force and the gravitational force exerted on that pulley are exerted at the axis of rotation, so they cannot cause a torque. And so that torque due to the tension is equal to the moment of inertia of this pulley. And for a solid cylindrical-like object like a pulley, the moment of inertia is 1 half mr squared. And lastly, I can't forget about alpha. Right, so that equation says the net torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. If you remember, the angular acceleration can be re-expressed in terms of A, the linear acceleration, and R of a given point as A divided by R. And so substituting that in, I have 1 half m R squared times alpha, which is A divided by R. If I multiply both sides by R, R squared will be on both sides of the equation, and so actually all of these R's get canceled. And what I'm left with is T equals 1 half MA. And now what I wanted to do was substitute that equation into my force equation for uh, the bucket, so that way I can get an expression for the acceleration. But what I find then is 1 half capital letter MA minus MG for the bucket, which was a lowercase letter m, equals m times negative a. And if the bucket and the pulley have different masses, then really I would need to know what those two masses are in order to solve for the acceleration of the bucket. So maybe for now, for simplification purposes, I just say that the mass of the bucket is the same as the mass of the pulley, which means that since each term has 
a letter M in it, then I could cancel those M's. So again, if the masses were actually different, I'm not allowed to do that, but we're assuming that the masses are the same for now. So now with the masses canceled, what do I get? If the masses are canceled, I have one half A minus G equals negative A. Rearranging that, I would have one half A plus A equals G. Right? One half A plus A equals G. Or three halves A equals G. Therefore, the acceleration is two thirds G. So for the bucket on the right, we get an acceleration of g. And for the bucket on the left, we have an acceleration of 2 thirds g. And of course, um, the acceleration is still negative. But for the bucket on the left, I plugged in the fact that the acceleration was negative earlier on. And so uh, I don't get that negative sign in the final answer. But either way, we know that the acceleration is uh, downwards and negative. So to bring this all together now, I need to write this uh, equation for the time it's going to take to reach the ground. For the other bucket, we had the square root of 2y over g. And now we need to plug in what that acceleration is for the other object. And so I'm going to continue from my equation that I wrote at the top, where I have the square root of 2y over a. Here we have the square root of 2y over the acceleration, which is 2 thirds g. And so we should see that those twos are going to cancel and the three is going to come up to the numerator. So I have the square root of three y over g. And so for the bucket on the left, the time equation is the square root of three y over g, whereas for the bucket on the right, it was two y over g. So why does that make sense? For the bucket on the right, we have a greater acceleration and so it gets down there in less time. Right? For a given y and a given g, the bucket on the right has a smaller number in the numerator, and so the amount of time it will take for it to get to the ground is going to be less. Whereas the bucket on the left has a smaller acceleration and a bigger number in the numerator, therefore it makes sense that it's going to take more time for it to get to the ground. And so uh, the amount of time it takes an object to go from point A to point B, that's one way we can study its motion. We can also just look at the accelerations. The accelerations are, you know, two-thirds g for the one on the left and g for the one on the right. And we could also approach it in different ways. But here, the point is uh, that we get a larger time for the bucket on the left because there is a smaller acceleration due to that upwards tension, which has to do with the fact that it's connected to the pulley and the pulley has to rotate to help it go down.